Hello our viewers. Previously on our discussion we have tried to revise the main points concerning on oscillations and waves. We have tried to define the main terms like cycle, period, frequency, amplitude, simple harmonic motion, damping oscillation and so on. And today we'll try to discuss about waves optics. What do you mean by wave optics? First we'll try to see the term wave optics. Wave optics is a branch of physics which mainly concerns the study of nature of light. Actually, there are different theories concerning on the nature of light. Uh, since the era of Greek philosophers, light is considered to be particles. Sometimes they are considered to be only have a wave nature. So among the different theories proposed on the nature of light, the common are um, wave theory and corpuscular theory as well as the quantum or the modern physicist theory, known to be the quantum theory. So, according to wave theorists, they consider the nature of light as a wave nature only. Corpuscular theory tries to propose that the nature of light appears due to the particle nature, whereas the quantum theory finalizes that it has both wave and particle, wave and particle dual nature. That's what it says. So, wave theory was uh, first proposed by um, Christian Hagen, and he tries to explain all the four properties of waves like reflection, refraction, diffraction, and interference using a wave nature, or it, was, it, is, it is explained due to that it is a wave nature. Whereas corpuscular theories tries to explain mainly the reflection and refraction of light due that it has a particle nature. So we'll try to see these one by one. First, to understand the concept of these uh, theories, first, we should have to know the main terms under these units. Uh, here we have wavefront and radiogram. These are important uh, terms. What do you mean by wavefront? First, let's try to see what do you mean by wavefronts. Wavefronts are a set of points or a locus of points of having the same phase. Suppose here you have a wave. It might be a spherical wave or it might be, there might be a planar wave. Suppose that it is a water ripple, so that there will be a series of concentric circles. So that some will be rising up. For example, if you try to see the section view of a water ripple, there will be higher and downward, upward and downward. The upper point is known to be the crests, whereas the down point part is known to be the trough. So it's possible to observe it from top view, so that this might be the crest, this might be the trough, this might be the crest, and the broken line represents the trough. So these points are set of points of having the same phase, because all those points are found on the crest. All those points are found on the trough. These points are all found on the crest, whereas these ones are found on the trough. Therefore, wave fronts are set of points or locus of points tries to represent particles or having the same waves, having the same phase. This is known to be wave fronts. So there can be a spherical wave front or there can be a planar wave front. For example, here you have a plane so that this might be the particles found on the crest, whereas this one are the particles found on the trough. So that crest, trough, crest, trough and so on. So these are known to be wave fronts, a set of points of having the same phase. Whereas radiogram is a diagram used to represent the direction of a wave. In which direction does this wave propagate? Does it propagate to the left, to the right, so that it is represented using a radiogram? In this case, suppose that the ray is acting on this direction, to the right, so that this wave is propagating to the right. And here we have a spherical wave front, so that we can have a wave radiogram. And one thing, very important thing is, radiogram and wave front has mutually perpendicular. So that this is the wave front, wave front and radiogram are perpendicular to each other. The same is true, for example, here you have a spherical wave front. At the point of contact, there is a point of tangency, so that the tangent line and the ray has a perpendicular to each other. Therefore, generally, we can say that wave fronts and radiogram are mutually perpendicular to one another. And the other point is the, the distance between two consecutive 
wavefront, for example, from this, from crust to crust, is known to be wavelengths, or it's possible to take from trough to trough is known to be wavelengths. We know that wavelengths is the minimum distance between two corresponding points of consecutive waves. So that should have to recall these points. So these are the main terms, wavefront and ray diagram. Now let's try to see those theories. The first theory is wavefront. Wavefront was proposed by a Dutch uh, physicist known to be Christian Huygen. So Christian Huygen proposed that the nature of light, like reflection, refraction, diffraction, and interference, is due that it has a wave nature. Actually, while he was alive, he was trying to explain about reflection and refraction, but the other one, diffraction, interference, and so on, was proposed by uh, the wave theory supporters like Thomas uh, Young, Augustine Fresnel, and so on. Therefore, uh, we'll try to see this theory. So Huygen proposed principles. And this principle is known to be Huygens principle. And this principle is very important to explain how does a light propagates. And it is very important to apply and prove that the proof of the law of reflection, refraction, and so on. What is the Huygens principle states? There are two statements of Huygens principle. The first statement states that points on the primary wavefronts are the source for the secondary Wavelets. Here, wavelets are very small spherical wavefronts. A very small spherical wavefronts are known to be wavelets. Therefore, suppose here you have a primary wavefront. On this wavefront, we have different points, points of disturbance. We know that waves are formed due to disturbance of particles. So if you take these particles, each particles will produce their own spherical wavefronts. Okay? And this particle as well produces its own wavefronts. And at this case, for example, let's take these and these wavefronts, wavelets. Those wavelets here and here, they are going to cancel one another because they are out of phase or anti-phase, so that the only thing left is here. So that they, there will be another wavefront produced. Again, points on these wavefronts are the source for the others or secondary wavelets. So the first statement states that. Points on the primary wavefronts are the source for the secondary wavelets. And the secondary wavelets, those spherical wavelets, are moving with the same wavelength, with the same frequency and speed as that of the primary wavefronts. So the primary wavefronts and the uh, wavelets, the secondary wavelets have the same frequency. So that keep in your mind. And it's very important law to prove the law of reflection, refraction, and so on. Here, let's try to see some of the properties of waves. Reflection, refraction, diffraction, and interference, as we have previously discussed under oscillation in waves, the common properties, they are the common properties of all waves. Light, as a wave, has a reflection, refraction, and diffraction, as well as interference. So reflection means the rebouncing of light from a given boundary. There might be a source. From that source, here, you might be having a source, it might be sunlight. From that, here you'd have a mirror or any obstacle, so that it might be rebounds. This is a regular reflection, whereas this one is irregular or diffuse reflection. So uh, whatever, there is a source and there is a boundary. The light which is reflected, which is rebounds from the boundary, is known to be a reflected wave. So light can be uh, rebounds back, so this is known to be a reflection. It's a well-known nature of light. Now, we are going to apply um, Huygens' principle to prove the law of reflection. The law of reflection states that if you take one of the light, for example, from among the incident rays, the incident rays are rays from a source, whereas re reflected rays are reflected rays from a reflected surface. Therefore, if you take incident ray and reflected ray, there is a law. Incident ray, a reflected ray, and normal line are coplanar. And the other law says that the angle of reflection and angle of uh, incidence and angle of reflection are equal. This is what the law of uh, reflection says that. And it's possible to apply Huygens principle to prove reflection. So it's a mathematical uh, approach that we are going to follow uh, using a similarity of triangle. It's possible to apply and prove that Huygens principle obeys the law of reflection. Okay? It's possible and you can find it in your physics uh, 
textbook. So it's possible to use a mathematical approach, similarity of uh, triangle and congruency of triangles. And the other property of light is refraction. Refraction is the bending of light as it travels from one medium to the other medium due to the change of speed. For example, here you might see a glass and here you have a straw. Uh, the straw seems to be broken due to that the light itself, the information tailored to our eyes is light. So the light is bending and it tells us that it seems that the straw is uh, as well bends. Therefore, this property of light is known to be refraction. So light refracts or bends as it propagates from one medium to the other medium due to the change of speed or due to the change of uh, speed of light. And in this case, for example, let's take two medium here, air and glass. Glass is more denser than air. So as light propagates in air, it will have a rect linear or straight motion. If there is no glass, actually the light is going to have its own straight motion. But suddenly it faces glass more denser particle so that the light is bending towards the normal line. Here you have a line which is perpendicular to the surface. So as light propagates, if it is a uniform medium, it will propagate straightly or rectilinear motion. But now there is a denser medium. As it faces a denser medium, it bends towards the normal line. Or if you reverse in the other direction, for example, if it is moving in the glass, then in air, then it will bend away from the normal line. If it's moved from the less denser medium to denser medium, it bends towards the normal line. As it moves from denser to less denser medium, it bends away from uh, the normal line. This is the property of light. And we do have a law of refraction. As previously mentioned that there is a law of reflection so that the angle of incidence and angle of reflection are equal. But here we have also another law known to be the law of refraction. In this case, for example, if you take uh, the incident ray and forms like this, if it is a uniform medium, it will propagate rectally in a motion. But it faces a more denser medium so that it bends towards the normal line. And the angle here, the angle of incidence from the normal line is relatively larger. Theta 1 is greater than theta 2. Why? Because it bends towards the normal line. So the law of refraction states that sine theta 1, sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 is equal to the speed of light as it propagates in medium 1 and the speed of light as it propagates in medium 2, the ratio of their speed. And one thing, very important thing is for the same time interval, as the light propagates in different medium, the frequency remains constant. For example, here, if there are four waves within a second, then again, when it propagates in this medium, there will be four waves within a second, so that the frequency remains the same, despite the change of velocity. The velocity in medium one and the velocity in medium two might be changed, but the frequency remains constant. We know that velocity generally can be given us, or speed of waves can be given us, lambda times frequency. If the velocity changes, and if the frequency remains constant, the wavelength also changes. So as medium changes, the velocity or the speed of the, uh, the light and the wavelength changes, but the frequency remains constant. Therefore, keeping this in your mind, V1 can be given as lambda times lambda 1 times F1. V2 can be given as lambda 2 times F2. In this case, frequency 1 and frequency 2 remains constant even though there is a change of medium. So keep this in your mind. It's possible to have V1 over V2. Instead of V1 over V2, lambda 1, frequency 1 over lambda 2, frequency 2. Frequency 1 and frequency 2 can be cancelled out because they are equal. Therefore, it's also possible to represent the law of refraction using lambda 1 over lambda 2. As well, it's possible to use refractive index. Refractive index is a, a correlation factor and it is tried to correlate the speed of light in vacuum over the speed of light in a given medium. So that it's given to be C over V, where C is the speed of light in vacuum, and it's three times 10 to the power of eight meter per second. And V is the speed of light in a given medium. It might be water, it might be glass, or any other medium. So that refractive index is always greater than one, because the fastest thing 
or the speed of light is faster in vacuum and it is the fastest thing in the universe so far. So it's possible to use refractive index instead of using uh, velocity and uh, wavelengths for the law of refraction. Sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 can be given as V1 over V2. So if you use a refractive index, a refractive index can be given as C over V1 for um, medium 1. And refractive index of 2 can be given as C over V2. This is known to be Snell's law. And it's possible to apply Huygens principle to prove the law of refraction. Okay, it's possible to prove the law of uh, refraction using Huygens principle. And again, we should have to follow mathematical approach and similarity of triangles to prove the law of refraction. You can find it on your textbooks deeply, so you can see that. And now let's try to see the other law, which is known to be corpuscular theory. Corpuscular theory was proposed by Sir um, Isaac Newton and it states that nature of light, like reflection and refraction and so on, can be explained due to that it has a particle nature, and it states that light is made up of a very tiny particle known as corpuscles. Tiny particle, it means in Greeks, uh, corpuscle means tiny particle. So that those particles are the one which enables light to have reflection, refraction, and so on. Therefore, uh, it, he tries to explain reflection as there is a ref Repulsive force, repulsive force between those particles, the particles of the uh, light, known to be corpuscles, and the, uh, here you'd have a reflective medium, it might be glass, so that the particle of the glass and the corpuscles has a repulsive force. We know that Sir Isaac Newton is somehow related with force, so that it, he tries to explain the reflection of light as a repulsive force between the particles of light, corpuscles, and the reflective medium. The other thing is different colors formed on our retina appears due to that corpuscles have different size. So light, different light from uh, sunlight appears different colors. Those colors are due to the difference in size of the corpuscles. This is how he reflects or this is how he replies. And refraction is due to the downward accelerating force. This is what he uh, proposed. There is a downward accelerating force so that those particles, the corpuscles, are moving more faster in a denser medium. This is what he says. But unfortunately, this theory is failed because that light is moving less faster in a denser medium. It's not moving more faster in a denser medium. This was later explained by Augustine Fresnel, Jane Fokelt, and Thomas Young as well, who uh, tries to answer uh, the question of corpuscular theory, and this theory is actually a failed theory, so that you can see this. And now let's try to see the other properties of light. So far we have tried to see reflection and refraction. There is also diffraction and interference. Diffraction means the scattering of light as it face obstacle or the bending of light as it face obstacle around the edge, if there is a tendency or a property of light to bend around an edge or any waves. Okay, actually not only for light, but it's very clearly possible to see that sound wave or any other wave can bend around um, a given obstacle. Here, you can have a gap. For example, you can have a planar wave front. As you face a gap here, there will be a scattering of light. This scattering of light is known to be diffraction. We call it to be diffraction. And diffraction is more visible for a larger wavelengths, even though the gap is larger, it's possible to observe that. But for waves like sunlight, sunlight has a very short wavelengths. For a very shorter wavelengths, the gap should be very, very small so that we can observe the diffraction nature. The gap should be very, very small. And the other property is known to be interference. Interference means the superposition or the addition of two or more waves. In this case, we are going to see the summation of two um, waves. And for, to observe the interference nature of light, we'll use slits. Slits are very gap or hollows, okay? Very small holes like this so that it's possible to have a source and pass from 
these two slits and form an interference pattern. Actually, we do have different slits. There can be single slit, double slit, triple, or multiple or gratings, so that it's possible to uh, eliminate light and observe the interference pattern. As we have discussed previously, there can be constructive and destructive interference. As we have discussed in waves, two waves can be constructively interfere if they are in phase, or they might be destructively interfere if they are out of phase or anti-phase. In this case, let's take a double slit interference. For example, if you have a source from here, it's possible to cast those light and allow it to pass through two slits. And those slits will diffract so that there is a diffraction nature of light. It will diffract here and here. And from this slit as well, it will diffract here and here. So that the light waves that are found here, around here, are going to be merged one another constructively and destructively. And there will be an observation of a series of light patches. There will be a brighter, darker, brighter, and darker, a series of light patches. And these light patches or uh, bands of light are known to be fringes. We call them to be fringes. So the superposed position of light beams will result a bright and dark light bands or parts known to be fringes. Dark fringes are known to be minima. We also known, call them to be minima. Whereas the bright fringes are known to be the maxima. The darker fringes are the result of destructive interference, whereas the brighter ones are the result of constructive interference. In this case, from slit 1, there will be a wave like this, and from slit 2, there will be a wave like this. As they join here, or superposed here, since they are in phase to one another, they will form a brighter spot, so that maxima is produced. And in this case, there might be a wave which is up Appearing from slit 1 and slit 2 are cancelling one another. They might be anti-phase so that they will form a darker spot. This darker spot is known to be minima. We call them to be minima. And there will be a central maxima. Then on the two sides, there will be a darker part known to be minima. So the central maxima, the first order minima, the first order maxima, and so on. These are formed due to constructive, destructive, constructive, and so on. Okay? This is what we call the interference nature of light. Actually, those nature appears due to the combination or the interference of two waves, and they will form a pass difference and a phase difference. Actually, pass difference means the difference of two waves in wavelengths, whereas phase difference means the difference of the two waves in measured in degree or radian. This is known to be phase difference and pass difference. It's possible to correlate phase difference and pass difference using this mathematical approach. This is what the phase, uh, the pass difference says. The pass difference is equal to the phase difference, phase difference in angle or in radian times lambda over 2 pi. It's possible to convert one into the other. Pass difference to phase difference, phase difference to pass difference can be mathematically expressed using this. As we mentioned here, the wave propagating from slit 1 and slit 2. Here, slit 1 and slit 2. The difference of the two rays, if the difference of the two rays is m times lambda, meaning the integral multiple of wavelengths, there will be a brighter spot or maximized format. Whereas, the, if the difference of the two or the pass difference is the odd multiplication, meaning 2m plus 1, lambda over 2. Okay, half of the wavelengths. If you have m is to be 0, you can have lambda over 2, m is 1, If you, have, you can have 3 times lambda over 2, 5 times lambda over 2, and so on. In such case, it's possible to have a darker sp spot or minima. So far, we have seen the interference pattern of double slit. It's also possible to observe interference pattern of a single slit, and a single slit forms a central maxima, which width is larger or twice as that of first order. Maxima. For example, the distance of the first order maxima is A and width of the central maxima is B. It's possible to correlate B as twice of A. Twice of the width of uh, the first order maxima can be expressed twice as that of the first order maxima. And now let's try to see about the mathematical approach, which was explained by Thomas Young, and tries to find the relation between the wavelengths, slit gap, 
and the screen distance and so on. So uh, this is a very important law. Mathematically, it was uh, very fundamental to prove that light has a wave nature. So the series of dark and bright spots found here can be mathematically expressed using this mathematical approach. Okay? So uh, it's possible to find that the light which is coming from this and reach here, we don't know this, from central maximum to any part. It might be the first order maximum, the first order minimum, second order, and so on. So the distance from the central maximum to that of any of the uh, pattern, for example, here, you might have the third order maximum. Therefore, the distance from this to this is the difference, the path difference form at change in x, meaning s2 minus s1. It's possible to find this and propagate straight line so that you can find a mathematical relation, theta here. So sine theta can be expressed as the path difference between the two waves. As we have said that the path difference is integral multiple of lambda, there will be a maxima. And if it is odd multiplication of lambda over two, there will be a minima. So that the difference change in x, it's possible to say that sine theta is change in x over the distance between the two slits is known to be a slit gap. We call it to be slit gap, or we can represent it using s. And the other thing is it's possible to project and form an angle theta so that tan theta, tan theta is opposite over adjacent. The opposite one is the distance between the central maxima to any order, maxima or minima. And so that y over tan theta, we need to express tan theta here, tan theta, say that y over d, where d is the distance between the double slit, and here you do have a screen. So that's possible to have a mathematical approach. This is the general expression, y is equal to change in x, d over s. But as change in x is m times lambda d over s, it is for maxima or bright fringe. Whereas as change in x is the odd multiplication of lambda over 2, it's possible to have uh, for minima m plus 1 over 2 lambda d over s. It's possible to have such a mathematical approach. Why is always remember that the distance between the central maxima to any order uh, of the maxima or minima. This is known to be Young's double slit experiment. And Young's double slit experiment, he used for his experiment, he used source. Here there is a color filter, single slit, double slit, uh, as well as the screen. Thomas Young used color filter to filter out uh, only a single wavelength. It, it's known to be monochromatic light. So produce a monochromatic light, Thomas Young used color filter. He used single slits so that there will be a sustainable uh, wave pattern formed on the screen. He used a single slit. Then he used double slit to propagate and form an interference pattern. Then he used a screen. Actually, nowadays, it's possible to use laser for propagating those uh, and form a coherent wave uh, forms. And coherent source can be expressed as coherent means the same type. That should be the same type of waves are interfering one another. The wave from this and this should be the same type. If it is light wave, this should be light wave. Sound wave and light wave cannot be interfered. So there should be a coherent source and this is known to be the same type and maintain a constant wave pattern or uh, phase relation so that there should be a monochromatic unless there will be a different uh, wave pattern and the phase relations are not going to be constant. Therefore, we mean coherent means the same type and there should be a constant wave front. And now let's try to see about a thin film interference pattern. So far we have tried to investigate about the nature of light, reflection, refraction, diffraction and interference. Among one of the natural phenomena of the result of interference, one is in colorful phenomena known to be thin film interference. And thin film interference is a colorful phenomenon formed on splashed oil, soap bubble, and so on, as well as on rainbow, we can see this colorful phenomenon. And it is all the result of the interference of light from the two layers of the thin film, okay? Here you can have the thin film, might be soap bubble, the soap bubble has the higher layer and the lower uh, layer. 
the reflection of the two lights, uh, for example, here you have a source, as this uh, light source cast on the upper surface, some of it might be reflected and some of it might be refracted and face the lower boundary. As well, it will be reflected back and as well refract. So the combination or the interference of these two rays, the rays which are reflected from the upper boundary and the lower boundary will form the colorful phenomenon. This colorful phenomenon is known to be the thin film interference. And the thin film interference mathematically can be expressed. And one very important thing you should have to know is, as light is reflected from the upper boundary, for example, here, the upper boundary has higher refractive. As light moves in air, its refractive index is uh, like 1. And let's say that this is water, might be the refractive index of water, 1.33. So it faces higher refractive index or high, high refractive surface. As light reflected from high refractive surface, there will be a 180 degree phase shift or phase change. Between the incident and reflected wave, there will be 180 degree phase shift. Whereas as it is, as it is reflected from less boundary surface, it will be in phase. Okay? There will be no change if it is reflected from less boundary surface. So the combination of these two rays combination of these two rays reflected from upper boundary and lower boundary will form a colorful phenomenon and there will be a constructive and destructive interference pattern the constructive interference pattern means that you can find the colors on each uh, spectrum whereas the destructive interference means among the spectrum you might miss one or two colors for example you may see um, red yellow orange. This might be the first order of spectrum. Again, you might see red, yellow. There will not be orange, for example. If you can't find, for example, let's say red, uh, let's take blue and yellow, let's say. Again, you might find red, there will be yellow. You miss a blue color. If you miss one of the color, it means uh, there will be a destructive interference on that spectrum. If you find the color, it means that there is constructive interference. So on thin film interference, destructive means you miss some colors. So keep in your mind that, and it's possible to have a mathematical expression, 2nt is equal to m plus 1 over 2 lambda for constructive interference, whereas 2nt is equal to m times lambda for destructive interference. Here, n means the refractive index of the film. The thin film might be made from uh, soap bubble, or oil paddles, so that's possible to find the refractive index of that. T is the thickness of the film. M, the order of the spectrum that you find, might be first order, second order, and so on. And lambda is the, the wavelengths of the light. For example, if you are trying to find red, previously we have said that blue is missed. Okay, So the wavelengths of the blue light in air can be given as lambda. Okay. Uh, and if you find red, for example, you can find the wavelengths of red in air. So lambda is the wavelengths of a given light in air. And know that N is the refractive index, T is the thickness of the oil. So that this is uh, for constructive and destructive interference of thin film interference. And at last, let's try to see about diffraction grating. Diffraction grating, so far we have tried to see about interference of single slit double slits and so on. Now let's try to see about the interference of multiple slits. Okay, As multiple slits are grooved on a single um, object, it's known to be grating. We call it to be grating. For example, here you'd have multiple slits, meaning within um, a centimeter there might be 500 or more than that number of slits or holes. So as light propagates through that slit, it will form an interference pattern there might be a different types of maxima and minima. Actually, it will form uh, principal maxima and subsidiary maxima. For example, this is the interference pattern of single slits. This is the interference pattern of the double slit. As the number of slits are increased, it will form two types of uh, bright maxima. Here, there is a principal maxima, and there is another smaller maxima, known to be subsidiary maxima. 
And as the number of slits are increasing more and more, there will be a brighter and br very thinner principal maxima and a less brighter uh, principal subsidiary maxima. For example, if this is the screen, exactly at the center, there might be the wider principal maxima. Then there will be a less maxima known to be subsidiary maxima. And there will be, again, principal maxima. There will be a very thin subsidiary maxima, and so on. This is what it says. As the number of slits are increasing and more and more, the uh, subsidiary maxima are very, in, the intensity is very low, and it's going to be very small. So this is uh, how the interference pattern formed in uh, diffraction grating. And there will be a mathematical approach for um, diffraction grating, and it says that sine theta m is m times lambda over d, where m is the order of spectrum. For example, here you have a device known to be the telescope. If you use a telescope or a spectrometer, you are trying to observe the different colors from diffraction grating. So that exactly at the center, you might see the white undivided light. So as you bend this at some angle theta, you might try to find different colors. For example, you might see here red color at this instant, so that the angle theta is possible to find. And you might find red so many times. The first order of spectrum, different colors. Again, you might find red on the second order of spectrum, and so on. So that keeping this in your mind, on the first order or on the second order of uh, spectrum, if you find an angle theta, it's possible to find sine theta of the m's order, meaning the first order spectrum or the second. Let's say, in this case, uh, this is a second order spectrum, meaning before that you can find rate on the first order spectrum. Again, you can find rate on the second order of spectrum. There are different order of spectrum so that the sine theta of the m's order is possible to have m times lambda times d, where lambda is the wavelength of rate in this case. And d is the space between each slits on the grating. Here, d is the space between each slit, and it's possible to express this in meter. And for example, if you have the grating, let's say that the grating is one centimeter, and on this one centimeter, you might have thousands or hundreds of number of slits. So the distance between each slit is known to be d. Okay, it's possible to find the d. For example, let's say that per one centimeter, here it says, for example, uh, let's take um, a grating of, of having 5,000 groups or slits per centimeter. So within one centimeter, if you find 5,000 slits, it's possible to find d, the length of the slits over the number of um, the slits. So that one centimeter per 5,000 gives us the uh, slit gap, or we call it to be d. So the sine theta m's order can be given as m times lambda over D. Keep this in your mind. And at last, let's try to solve this simple example. Here it says yellow light with a wavelength of uh, 589 nanometers strikes the diffraction grating with normal incidence, meaning perpendicular. So the grating slits have 5,000, as we have said uh, previously, per centimeter. So at what angle will you see the light, meaning uh, you can find the order of spectrum to be one. Uh, the first order of spectrum, you can see a yellow light on the spectrometer. So first, it's possible to find d. We know that d is the length of the groove per uh, number of slits. So that one centimeter per 5,000. And to convert it into meter, you should have to multiply it, multiply it 10 raised to minus 2. So that 2 times 10 to the power of minus 6 meter is the distance between each uh, slits. So we can find D and M order of spectrum, the first order of spectrum. So from previous uh, equations, sine theta 1 can be expressed as M times lambda over D. M is already 1. So that substituting all the value, we can find it to be sine theta 1 to be 0 0.2945 radian. It is expressed in radian. And you should have to convert it into uh, degree so that it is 17 degree. As you move your telescope or spectrometer at exactly 17 degree, you can find it the yellow color or the first order of 
uh, spectrum. So we can solve different examples and you can proceed on. So this is all that I've got uh, for today. Next time we'll try to see about electrostatics. So goodbye for today.